Before I ran the Hubble Space Telescope, I used to build telescopes, actually quite big telescopes. In fact, so big they wouldn't actually fit into this room. And they weren't telescopes we could put into space. They weighed over 600 tons. So imagine my surprise when a few years ago I realized if we could take those technologies that we have on the ground and put them into space, astrophysics once again could change the world. Now, how do I make such an audacious claim? Well, if you imagine pointing a telescope at another star, finding perhaps a small planet around that star, and for the first time in human history, detecting life. And that's what we are on the verge of being able to do. Because of a confluence of technology and science, we're able to answer one of those most fundamental questions that, of course, has haunted us for millennia. What astronomy and astrophysics do is turn these speculations into actual ideas that we can defend through the use of data. And the first person who did this was Copernicus. He looked at the movement of the stars and realized it was much simpler to place the sun at the center of our solar system rather than the Earth. And of course, it wasn't a particularly popular idea. And this poor chap here, who actually then took this idea and said, oh, there must be lots of other Earths out there, we're not very special, got burnt at the stake. It was his contemporary, Galileo, here showing the Dodge of Venice, this newfangled device called the telescope, pointing out that he could actually see the enemies before anybody else, that actually made this an irreversible change. Because he took this simple device and for the first time lifted it to the sky and actually saw the moons of Jupiter orbiting Jupiter and realized observationally that the sun had to be in the center of our solar system. And this change was irreversible because anybody could take this relatively small 17th century handheld device and lift it to the sky and see for themselves that the universe and our worldview had radically changed. 400 years later, this is the tool we're going to use. It's the Hubble Space Telescope. It's flying above our head roughly 300 miles at 17,000 miles an hour. It's the size of a school bus. And for 20 years, it's been looking at the universe and changing the way we think about the universe and our place in it. It's told us how old the universe is. It's told us the black holes exist. It's found a myriad of galaxies. And what perhaps you don't realize is it's really moved forward this whole picture of our universe where looking for life around other stars becomes a legitimate scientific enterprise. Here's a picture. And of course, like Galileo, you can now take out your own handheld device and download these pictures anytime you want. This is a picture the Hubble took of a region of our galaxy. You're seeing 100,000 stars here. The red ones are rather cool, the blue ones are very hot, the yellow ones and the orange ones are like our sun. So you can see tens of thousands of stars in this single point in our galaxy, stars just like our sun. There they are. Now, of course, we know that we're actually part of a very large universe. We're actually part of galaxies, and in fact, here's a picture of galaxies from the Hubble Space Telescope. This one on the left here is very much like our own. It's actually 60 million light years away, a little bit further than Baltimore. <laughs> and it contains 100,000 stars. But how our perspective really changed is when the Hubble decided to look at a single blank piece of sky, no bigger than if you pick up a drinking straw and look through that, and it stared at that little single point for over 11 days continuously, and this is what it saw. In this image, there are only three stars. Every other point of light here is another galaxy. In this image, no bigger than a drinking straw, there are 10,000 galaxies. Now imagine how many galaxies there are across the whole universe. Take all those drinking straws, multiply by the number of stars in each galaxy, and I'll do the maths for you. There are an awful lot of stars <laughs> in our universe, even too much for us to look for. So let's reduce the odds somewhat. Let's reduce our needle in the haystack problem by at least 200 billion and focus just on our own galaxy. Because the question we really want to know, are there any Earths in our own galaxy? Once again, we can ask the question, are there planets out there? We'll turn to the Hubble again. Let's ask, where do stars come from? And so we'll go to the center of Orion, Orion, the great Orion Nebulae, as seen by the Hubble Space Telescope here. 
Here's where stars are being born. And in the corner, in a quiet corner, we found these strange, shadowy objects. And what these are, are in fact planetary systems in formation. And this, of course, is switching to an animation. We don't actually see this. But what it tells us is, is that every time stars are formed as a natural product, planets emerge. And in fact, in the last decade or so, we found over 400 planets, but we haven't actually seen them. All we've seen is their effects as they wobble the sun. What we really want to do is, can we see them? The problem is they're very faint. Here are our own planets taken by Voyager, four billion miles from here, as it took a fleeting last look. Planets are very faint. But we were very fortunate a few years ago with the Hubble Space Telescope to take this picture. It was a young star, one of those disk systems, and we watched it for over a couple of years, and we found a planet. This is the first picture of another solar system 25 light years from here. We can actually do other things with the Hubble. We can actually watch what happens as a small planet goes in front of a star. The light changes imperceptibly, less than 1%, but the Hubble is so stable, it can actually measure that strange change, that small change. And this is what we did. And I'm not moving. There we go. We stared at 180,000 stars over a period of a week, looking for those small changes in light. And what we saw were 17 little dips, 17 planetary systems. And you may say 17 doesn't sound very much out of 180,000, but think of how many stars there are in a galaxy, 100 billion. Do the math, do the corrections. And we now know that, in fact, there are a billion planetary systems in our galaxy. Did you know that we already knew there are a billion planets in our, planet, in our galaxy? We made that discovery with the Hubble some years ago. The question is, is there life around any of these? Well, the only way we can answer that is to look at the only planet we know that actually has life, our Earth. And we can take the light from our Earth and actually reflect it off the Moon, and then split it up into its component parts, put it through like a prism, and produce this DNA trace that you see here, this wiggly line. Each one of these wiggles actually means something. That first dip means there is vegetation that can harvest life, light. The other dips there mean there's oxygen, methane, carbon dioxide, water, liquid water. All of those together, this is the trace of life, the sign of a living planet. So the question is, can we actually find any of these molecules? Well, about two or three years ago, we actually looked at one of these Jupiter planets, 63 light years for here, from here, and as it moved in front of the star, we caught the shimmer of its atmosphere through the Hubble Space Telescope and detected methane in a system 63 light years from here. We have since detected water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen in this planetary system. Now, this is a big Jupiter. We're not surprised by those things, but it tells you that in planetary systems, Light years away from here, all the elements of light, life exist. Of course, what we really want to do is to look for those very small planets. Here is our penalty of all our solar system objects. These big, very fat Jupiters here are what Hubble can see. But how do we see these very small little Earths at the end here, like us? It turns out these it turns out to be very difficult, because they're very faint. Hubble can see these big Jupiters, but to see a small Earth takes a much bigger telescope. Because there's a second problem. We actually want to find life. And life, we think, comes with liquid water. If the planet is too close to a sun, like Venus, it gets fried. If it's too far away, it gets frozen. There is a just right point, the Goldilocks point, the habitable zone, where a planet must be for liquid water to exist. And when you put all those things together, we realize that the Hubble itself was actually too small a telescope, which means we actually have to produce a new telescope, which we fortunately started building about a decade ago to do something else, to look for the very first galaxies. And here is the Webb telescope that we will eventually, hopefully in 2016, send beyond the moon it's a very different telescope. It's a very much larger telescope. But this telescope is so large, it might actually, for the first time, be able to detect 
liquid water around a transiting star. Not around an Earth, but we found these objects called super-Earths. They're about five or six times bigger than the Earth. But if we could find liquid water in another planetary system, we're beginning to move on. And so these ocean planets might well exist, and we will be able to find them. So we'll know liquid water is out there. But of course, the final question is, can we find Earths? It turns out we've learned an awful lot in the last 400 years of astrophysics. We've learned that roughly 10% of all planets have, 10% of all stars have planets. We've learned that there's a habitable zone in our galaxy, which we fortunately live in. So our local neighborhood is typical. And we also know an awful lot about our local haystack. We know where all the stars are nearby. Here are all the stars within 200 light years. And we know which stars are like our sun. Here they are. In a computer, we can put an Earth around every single one and ask the question, how big a telescope do we need to take this DNA trace? And this is how many we could do with a four-meter telescope, but like the web. Here's what we could do with an eight-meter. But if you just double the size of the telescope, the number of stars goes up by a factor of 10 because you get a bigger volume. And so you can actually find, sample 1,000 stars nearby. Now, that begins to get interesting as an astronomer because it means you could find life around at least one of those thousand stars because you can do the experiment. Now, you need a very big telescope to do this, much bigger than we're planning, and people would say, but this is crazy. This is a very hard thing to do. But this is where we come back to the ground. We have been building telescopes on the ground for over 400 years, and the technologies that we actually use can actually be moved to space. The Hubble is not much more sophisticated than the telescopes we actually built in the 40s. The James Webb, not much more than telescopes we built in the 80s. The new telescopes we've been building today, which use modern computer technologies and new adaptive optics and active optics, these are very flimsy mirrors where computers keep everything in shape, we could move to space. And in fact, it means there is actually a Moore's law of space telescopes. If you stood in the 1980s and said, how would I build a 6.5-meter telescope and put it into space? Everybody would go, you're crazy. It's going to cost a fortune. Well, 20 years later, we did it. This is the James Webb Space Telescope for the same cost as the Hubble. And it looks nothing like the Hubble because it's a completely new technology. Innovation has moved on and allowed us to do new things. And so the challenge for the next generation of engineers and scientists, and for the kids who want to know what can I do to change the world, is we can think of making an even bigger telescope. NASA wants to build new rockets. We have new ideas, and with big telescopes in space, we can do remarkable things. We can watch the weather with infinite detail. We might be able to gather energy, or we might be able to look out and answer that final question. We could imagine for the first time in human history, we could do this. We could look around another Earth-like planet and answer the question that has haunted our civilization for millennia, are we alone? And that, I think, is an idea that will irreversibly change the world. Thank you.